Our story starts here in the mountains of Michoacan in western Mexico in mid-February. This is Sierra Chinqua, and Isabel Ramirez stands among the trees. Her orange outfit matches the monarch butterflies surrounding her. You can tell from her voice that she's a butterfly lover. They are beautiful. It's impossible not to be attracted by monarch butterflies. They provide a feeling of, of tranquility and peace and wonder. Ramirez is a geographer at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. She's working to conserve the forests of Michoacan inside the monarch butterfly biosphere reserve to prevent illegal logging for the sake of the trees and the butterflies. Because literally millions and millions of monarchs call this sanctuary home in the wintertime. Maybe around 50 million butterflies around us in this moment. And that's just in these couple acres. Monarchs coat the ground, the trees, and before long, Ramirez has a couple in her hands. I think they are small pieces of sunlight. Such a delicate animal, each one the weight of a paper clip. Now, as we approach the end of February, the peaks of Michoacan start warming up, and the butterflies feel it. Sometimes a whole colony will pick up and settle back down together, literally moving from one location on the mountaintop to another. And by the middle of March, it's time for the monarchs to begin one of the most epic journeys in the animal kingdom. Their incredible migration is unparalleled. Karen Oberhauser has studied monarchs for 25 years. She's a biologist at the University of Minnesota. Now, to follow the monarch migration, we're going to fly along with the butterflies. And be sure to watch the timeline in the upper left. Okay, cue the epic journey music. Males and the females leave the overwintering colonies and fly north through Mexico. They cross the neovolcanic mountain range and and cross the mountains on the east side of Mexico and fly up into southern Texas. The butterflies fan out, covering the southeastern quarter of the U.S., laying eggs as they go. If you imagine Monarchs is kind of this wave of insects that are moving northward and eastward. They're looking for specific kinds of habitat along the way. Habitat that must include milkweed. It's the only kind of plant that the caterpillars can eat, as well as other nectar sources for the adults. Now, let's pause for a moment here and consider the monarchs laying their little eggs on the milkweed. When Oberhauser described it to me, I was reminded just how astonishing that transformation is from egg into adult. We have this caterpillar that's kind of like a worm. They're this earthbound thing that's kind of squishy and kind of mushy. And then they go through this transformation where it's almost like they die when they get into the chrysalis. So they're in the stage that, from the outside at least, they, they don't even look alive. And then they transform into this incredibly beautiful organism that throws off the chains of the earth and is able to to fly away. Okay, back to the journey. The butterflies from Mexico live no more than a month after leaving their overwintering mountaintops and laying their eggs. And so it's this next generation, born in the southeastern U.S. in what's called their spring range, that pick up the next chapter of the migration. Which goes northward into what we call their summer breeding range. So this is everything kind of from a line through the middle of the United States up into southern Canada. The migration is filled with peril. Butterfly eggs are gobbled down by ants and spiders and wasps. Most animals avoid eating the adult monarchs because they taste bad, but there are a couple types of birds that do find them palatable. The black-headed grosbeak and the black-backed oriole. Then there's bad weather. A drought or a really bad storm can decimate the monarch numbers. But perhaps the biggest threat on their journey these days is habitat destruction. And that habitat consists of milkweed. The middle of the United States used to be one big prairie. And all of that land was suitable habitat. We now have a patchwork of cities and agricultural fields broken up by by completely inappropriate habitat, which would be things like roads and parking lots. 
Oberhauser told me that cities aren't necessarily bad for monarchs. Take Minneapolis, where residents have planted milkweed and other butterfly-friendly plants in parks, lawns, and gardens. Still, a city means a lot less monarch habitat than before. Agricultural fields used to be okay, with lots of milkweed mingling with the crops. But now, in this age of genetically modified corn and soybeans, farmers spray their fields with herbicides that wipe out the milkweed. All this disrupted habitat makes the going much tougher for the monarchs, and over the last few years, their numbers are down. But there are still many butterflies that do make it, that find milkweed, and that lay more eggs. They go through two or three more generations in the northern part of their range, breeding, laying eggs, finding milkweed plants, and then after about August 15th, the butterflies fly south again to the overwintering sites in Mexico. Yeah, it's incredible. No one butterfly completes the whole journey. And for those of you keeping score, it takes up to four generations to finish the full migration, to leave Mexico and to get back again. Now, that's just one part of the story, the story told from the butterfly's point of view. But over the course of their journey, those butterflies come in contact with a kind of human army, thousands of citizen scientists, everyday people allowing us to get to know these monarchs better and help them out along their way. So let's rewind the clock to September, once the butterflies have begun flying south again. We're going to zoom in here on Cape May, New Jersey, where Mark Garland is a naturalist. We get an abnormal number of monarchs here because we're the very southern tip of New Jersey, and the land is literally tapering like a funnel. And as these butterflies migrate, they're much more comfortable over land than water, so they stay over land and get funneled uh, down into Cape May proper. Literally, when there's a lot of monarchs around, they're everywhere. We laugh. Sometimes you feel like you're inside an orange snow globe. But Garland doesn't just watch the monarchs. He tags them. It's part of a citizen science project run out of the University of Kansas called Monarch Watch. The tagging involves small adhesive stickers that are put on the wings of a monarch butterfly. The size of the sticker is about the same as your little finger nail. By the time you catch it, put the sticker on and let it go. It's 30 seconds if you're good, if you've been doing it a long time. That's Garland's wife, Paige Cunningham. She's a naturalist and educator, and she told me that before she lets the butterflies go, she whispers to them. Sometimes I'm just like, have a good journey. Sometimes I wish them good luck. I don't always know what I'm gonna say to them until I have them in my hand. I don't know, it's like a secret in a bottle or a wish or a hope or a dream or something and then it flies away. Cunningham and Garland recruit a bunch of people and each year the team dots hundreds of butterfly wings with these tiny sticker tags. On the tag, is a unique code of three letters and three numbers. It's like the social security number of the butterfly. And it's this social security number here that can be used to track the butterflies along their migration route, where other people catch them and read off the code. Every time a tagged monarch is found somewhere else, you've connected the dots on migration. We found monarchs here in Cape May that have been tagged in New York State and Pennsylvania and other parts of New Jersey. And the butterflies routing through Cape May have been found as far south as Florida and Texas, even Mexico. And there have been a few New Jersey monarchs that the wind's blown out to the Bahamas. Now, some of the butterflies pass through Georgia, where Mary Beth Carey teaches the fifth grade in the town of Sylvester. I want the students to use the butterflies to connect with and go beyond the boundaries of our town. For the last few years, she and her students have been taking scotch tape, placing it on monarch butterfly abdomens, peeling it off, and sending it to the University of Georgia. That's where a program called Monarch Health counts up the number of external parasites on the butterflies to figure out how healthy they are. Carrie's students love being part of the butterflies' lives. I really like working with insects. We should help them. As the butterflies flutter along, countless people are on the lookout, entering their sighting locations, and some of them recorded themselves to tell us about their encounters, all the way from Brackettville, Texas. Right now, I'm surrounded by trees with beautiful arcing limbs. The butterflies, I can't believe they're still here. I am so excited. To Vermont, where the state butterfly is the monarch. 
When I was little, my mom would buy me the Grow a Monarch Butterfly kit, and we would watch them in our house until they grew up, and then we would set them free. To Wisconsin. Butterflies are beautiful, and they are wonderful. To North Carolina. I've been watching monarchs all my life. My wife came up with the theme of monarchs for our wedding. On our custom-made cake topper, the bride and groom chased a monarch hand-in-hand with the groom holding a butterfly net. You get the idea. Monarch butterfly lovers are everywhere. So let's return to the end of the monarch journey one more time. As the butterflies make their way back towards Mexico, they gather into thicker and thicker ribbons as they fly. By the time they hit Texas, the monarchs stop people in their tracks. They cluster up in these pecan trees like grapes and just are draped everywhere. As you walk down the, the river trail, they just erupt in these butterfly clouds of orange. My house looks out onto the sunset in Mexico, seeing hundreds of thousands of monarchs almost flowing like a river through the sky. That river flows back into Mexico, winding around the mountaintops to settle down for another winter. It's a river of orange sunshine that graces the people it passes, and many of those people reach out to touch that river and to hold, if even for a moment, a single butterfly in their hands.